Hi, everybody. I'm Jennifer Polka. Um, I run a nonprofit called Code for America. We're based up in San Francisco. Uh, and it's exciting to be here. I ha didn't realize how many connections our work would have to an event like this. Um, Tim O'Reilly, who you heard from this morning, is on our board. We were hearing about uh, amazing um, opportunities to use data about um, police body cams and dash cams earlier from Dr. Eberhard. And this is all very relevant to our work, which is focused on using the talent of the technology industry to help government work better. Uh, we say that government can work for the people, by the people in the 21st century if everyone lends a hand. Um, so I'm delighted to um, be so inspired by all of the talks that are here today and really looking forward to this one, um, not only in my role as uh, somebody who thinks about how, how uh, data and learning can be brought into a government context, but also as a parent, because I know it will be very relevant. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk today about the new literacies. Um, we're going to discuss the promises and perils of technology on literacies, linguistic, numeric, and digital literacies. And um, if you would like to deliver the tea now, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Never had it. This is my husband. Um, so is worldwide literacy achievable now that we have low-cost mobile and technolog technologically assisted teaching options? What changes to the human brain and to human culture might result? We have two amazing women here today um, who are researchers and who are exploring the evidence um, that is grappling with these questions. Um, so I'm just going to introduce both of them now. Uh, then we'll hear from Marianne, uh, who has a brief presentation, and then from um, Morgan um, with, uh, well, another presentation, but, but without slides. And um, then we will uh, open it up to questions and have a great dialogue about this. Um, so our first uh, presenter is Dr. Marianne Wolf. She received her doctorate from Harvard in the Department of Human Development and Psychology in the Graduate School of Education, uh, where she began her work on the neurological underpinnings of reading, language, and dyslexia. Uh, she's the author of over 140 scientific articles, including the book Dyslexia, Fluency, and the Brain. And I love this, uh, a book called uh, Proust and the Squid, <laughs> the, new, the story and science of the reading brain, translated now into 13 languages. Um, most recently, she's applying neuroscience to the design of global literacy apps in Africa, India, Latin America, and in the rural United States. Um, she has several awards to her credit. Uh, the Distinguished Professor of the Year Award at uh, the Massachusetts Psychological Association, Teaching Excellence Award from the American Psychological Association. She was a Fulbright Fellow in Germany, uh, where she conducted research on dyslexia. Um, she, ha she has an NICHD uh, Shannon Award for innovative research and many multi-year grants from NICHD. Um, and the Norman uh, Geschwind Lecture Award and Orton Award from the International Dyslexia Association. So I'm excited to hear what she's got to say. And before we do that, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Morgan Ames. She's a research scientist in the Department of Informatics at the University of California, Irvine. And she's a visiting fellow at the Slow Science Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. She has a PhD in communications from Stanford University and an MS in information science and a BA in computer science from, UK, from Berkeley. Um, so Morgan researches education technology, uh, media literacy, and some education practices, and particularly is focusing on these beliefs about technology's role in the acquisition of technical knowledge. She's collaborated with research teams at Google, Yahoo, Nokia, Intel, and she critically examined everyday understandings of new media technology among college students and also among, I believe, kids under 10. Um, she has done this amazing investigation of the One Laptop Per Child project, which I believe she's going to talk about today. Um, and she's really looked at the motivations behind the development of that um, uh, project, how its laptops were understood and used, particularly in Paraguay, which was a, a, one of the primary pilot sites for mm -hmm. the, uh, for the uh, One Laptop Per Child. Um, so this is, this is fascinating. Um, she's provided a detailed day-to-day -day account of the day-to-day um, -day use of one laptop per child there. And her findings highlight the role and, of course, the limitations of technological utopianism in education and development projects. 
She also has many, many awards, including the Nathan Maccabee Outstanding Dissertation Award, the Best of CSCW 2010 Award, was nominated for the Best of CSCW 2013, and she's currently working on a book on One Laptop Per Child that's going to come out in 2017. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, and a project that focuses on the social meanings of a One Laptop program in the Iron Triangle community, which is in Richmond, California, just north of here. Um, so welcome to both of you. And Marianne, why don't you kick it off? Okay. Now we are going to have something completely different about new knowledge, your own brains and the brains of your children. And so what I'm going to do in seven minutes is create a reading brain circuit and tell you why there is both promise and challenge in what is going on uh, with regard to our children's learning different literacies in a digital culture. And so there will be a light motif, if you will, of the promise and the challenge. And it begins with a mystery. How in the world did our human brain ever learn to read or to do mathematics or to program when we have nothing in our genetic program that allows us to do this? There is no one reading center in the brain. The way we did this is based on principles based on our neuroplasticity. And basically, sometimes I, I use the brain of someone who's, whose frontal lobe is more exposed than others. So, Jack, if you don't <laughs> mind, I will use this very quickly to show you that what we do when we have this reading circuit is to literally recycle areas that were used for face and object recognition. And then we have this whole system in which this occipital area, our prefrontal, which is beautifully exposed, Jack, our prefrontal areas, our temporal areas, all come together and make this magical reading circuit. But it's something that's plastic. It is affected in so many different ways by a writing system. Those of you, of course, who speak English use a very particular one. This is only the smallest rendition of what an English system does to decode. If you speak Chinese or kanji, this is a... F oh, you... Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. You use... I won't be back to Jack after this. Um, when we use a Chinese or a Japanese kanji system, we use other areas in our, in our right, if you can see in the second slide, our, our right visual areas and, and Japanese kana yet again, a, a slightly different system. What we see here in this rude one minute example is that there is no one reading circuit. There are multiple ones, and they are going to be changed due to this plasticity. They're going to be changed by the writing system and by the medium. And therein lies both the promise and the challenge for our children. What are the implications of having a plastic reading circuit in a digital culture that emphasizes, as all of us knows, no, speed, immediacy, multitasking. And Tim referred this, to this earlier with his continuous partial, but I call it, that. well, it's been called by many people, continuous partial attention in our children. The reality is that our children and youth today are in, involved in an experience of complete distractibility. Our mean distraction per hour is 27 times. So the quest, there are so many questions that come. But one of the questions is about how the affordances of print and how the affordances of a digital medium are affecting the, the, the very plastic reading circuit. What will be the implications of this new normal of reading? And all of you must have your own experiences about the changes in the quality of attention, your ability to have sustained, concentrated attention, your retreat from density and complexity of text. I was so thrilled to see Rilke <laughs> this morning. Uh, but there is a steady change in that quality of attention in all of us, not just in our children. But there are differences in memory and attention, not only in our children, but also in us. But for me, the primary interest is in the children. What will the changes in attention actually mean? Will there be a complete difference in how they acquire knowledge and use external platforms so readily, which has great promise, but also the challenge that they will potentially not be developing their internal platform of knowledge in the same way? 
And so from my standpoint, one of the questions is, will we ultimately, without sufficient, in, well, with no intention, but with insufficient research, actually be developing a more short-circuited reading brain? Now, I facetiously, whimsically use Jack's prefrontal cortex for all of you. But the reality is, when we are reading, it's almost like a geometric progression in those reading circuits. The more we read, the more elaborate, the denser we read, the more we attain almost the, the epitome of what a reading brain circuit can have. Will that be changed, and how can we address it? And the question that I ask is whether or not the medium can address its own weaknesses. And so with a group at MIT Media Lab and Georgia State University, we've developed something called Curious Learning, in which we are taking apps that are curated on the basis of the reading brain circuitry. They're curated on that basis, and then made in a laptop that children are using who have no schools or who are in settlement-like schools in South Africa, preschools in Uganda, <coughs> India, and now in the rural US, in which we are taking these apps and seeing in each educational context, what can our children learn? Can child-driven learning in places with no schools enhance the development of literacy? We're using an open source platform and in various places, um, each is, is somewhat different. So we are trying to harness the promise of technology for basic literacy and for new literacies. And there are many stories that perhaps in the questions and answers that we can, can talk about. But at this point, we are in Ethiopia with, in places without schools, Uganda in preschools. In rural US, we are looking at children who have a vocabulary of 400 words instead of three to 5,000. Can we use these apps for the development of the precursors of literacy in whole new ways? And so part of our work in rural US is in fact showing we can change uh, so much about the precursors of literacy. And so our mission is to join forces with many different groups, groups like yours, groups like Save, um, Save the Children, groups like Reach Out and Read the Pediatricians. Can we take the best knowledge of our implementation with technology, with the information that is constantly evolving about the reading brain, and can we change the face of literacy? There are 100, well, 200 million children who will never become functionally literate. 50 to 70 are completely non-literate and have no schools. Can we make a difference? We believe we absolutely can. And so I end, <laughs> turn it to you, with this is our real hope um, in order uh, for us to move into that next generation. We believe technology has both promise, great challenge. We want to put them together. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne. Oh my goodness, Marianne, you are a hard act to follow. <laughs> it's a very rich and provocative set of insights. Um, and I think we are well set up for a really interesting discussion coming up next. Um, I want to bring in a little bit more cultural view of the many kinds of literacies that, that digital technologies and the computers in particular are meant to provide for children, uh, which is based on my ongoing research on the One Laptop Per Child project, which designed this little laptop right here, in case yes. any of you want to play around with one. I do need to charge it. I didn't realize it was out of battery. Um, but first, I want to open up with a quote on, uh, that encapsulates some of the promise of technology in education, or that technology is supposed to have in education. And it goes like this. Books will soon be obsolete in the public schools. Scholars will be instructed through the eye. It is possible to teach every branch of human knowledge with this technology. Our school system will be completely changed in 10 years. Um, so my question to all of you is, who is this, and what technology are they referring to? Um, it's easy to imagine this being a quote from Nicholas Negroponte, the yes. founder of One Laptop Per Child. It's easy to imagine it maybe being said by Salman Khan of the Khan Academy about MOOCs. Um, but in fact, it was, it's a quote that's 100 years old. It was said by Thomas Edison in 1913 about motion pictures. And um, I think it is safe to say that in this case, at least, Edison's grand predictions didn't quite pan out the way he was talking about. Uh, we still have books. Schools have changed, um, but motion pictures 
probably weren't the cause of that change. And um, as an extension, the ability to read is certainly not obsolete. If anything, it's as important as ever. Um, even so, similar statements have been said about uh, major new technologies. Since 1913, radio, for example, was supposed to make cultural misunderstandings impossible. Uh, cable television was supposed to enable inverted classrooms, which again have been a, a recent trend in education, um, and, or even the obliteration of physical classrooms entirely. Um, this is not to say that these technologies have not had massive impacts in our lives. Um, but the possible effects on the institutions and cultural structures of literacy are dwarfed by the very well-documented effects of the dramatic political, economic, sociocultural changes in our world um, that have gone on in the last hundred years at the same time. So to pin the credit or blame on technology would be to ignore all of this evidence of the centrality of these social and infrastructural players. Um, with these social sociocultural changes, though, come new demands for new kinds of literacies. The ability to read has long been important. Uh, the, a facility with numbers has similarly been very useful for a long time. A newer kind of literacy is the ability to understand the inner workings of digital machines, uh, which, as a former computer scientist, I can say is highly related to mathematical literacy and increasingly important. Um, and I would add to this list an urgent need for critical media literacy, as more and more of our lives are touched by the products and processes of large corporations. Of these four literacies, the One Laptop Per Child Project wanted to impact mathematical and technical literacies in particular, and through them, the others. They designed a rugged, open-source laptop with the goal of radically transforming the lives of children across the global south. Though publicly announced in 2005, uh, the project reaches back over 40 years be uh, before that, um, based on work by MIT professors Nicholas Negroponte and Seymour Papert. Um, and while OLPC's goal of and hundreds of millions of laptops across the Global South never quite came true, they do have two and a half million laptops in use around the world, 85% of them in Latin America. So there's still really a lot of these laptops out there. Um, but despite the project's high profile, there's very little known about what they are actually doing on the ground. Um, and based on my research, I have some ideas why. What I did find across seven months of field work in Paraguay and also visits to other large One Laptop or Child projects in Peru and in Uruguay um, was quite different from OLPC's vision. In Paraguay in particular, I found that about two-thirds of kids were not very interested in using their laptops at all. Some of, these la some of this was because laptops would break. Um, these laptops were rugged, but no, no piece of technology is impervious, as anyone who has had uh, technology used by children can say. Um, but there were also a number of kids who just weren't very interested in the laptops. They didn't find them very compelling. Um, and I think this is a very sobering result for a project that really hoped to transform the lives of all it touched. Perhaps more sobering still, though, is this. Of the one-third of children who did use their laptops regularly, uh, their usage was pretty heavily moderated by big media companies such as Nickelodeon and MTV. And even Nestle took advantage of this new audience with a game developed specifically for OLPC's laptop that promoted Nestle products. Paraguay is an interesting one laptop or child location because unlike Peru and some others, the NGO in charge of the project there put extensive infrastructure in to, to support student learning both within and outside of the classroom. But even with this, the project is no magic bullet for any of the four literacies I mentioned. It did not really impact reading scores. It didn't clearly help kids do mathematics better. Kids did have more technological proficiency, but it didn't really help them understand the inner workings of technology in the way that many of the open source developers behind the project really wanted. And, um, and it didn't help them really look at media in a more critical way in their lives. If anything, it gave corporations a way to advertise to these children via an avenue considered educational. It is striking, too, that even as one laptop per child pushed laptops across the global south, many middle-class parents in the United States were restricting this kind of media use among their children, and for good reason, as a growing body of research on multitasking, attention, and learning shows. Even some Silicon Valley executives send their children to private schools that are completely technology-free. This contrast does make me wonder what the real promise or peril technology really holds for various literacies, reading, mathematics, technology, and critical media. All in all, the promise and perils of OLPC is similar to the promise and perils of laptop programs more generally. 
um, and that larger body of research that shows that programs that are very well supported and go to communities that have good infrastructure and, and uh, social, kind of social support for this do have moderate benefits. They can increase reading uh, moderately, they increase technological proficiency moderately, um, they are no magic bullet, but, um, but they do have positive effects, and I think that's really important. Um, so many stories rely on, on magic bullets and, and utopias, but really the kinds of effects that we can realistically have are modest but positive things. On the other hand, though, there are a number of projects that haven't had very good support, that don't have the social support, they don't have the infrastructure to support in schools, and this can actually harm students academically with, the, with uh, socially disadvantaged students most harmed. Um, so, in short, these results suggest that laptops really are no silver bullet for learning anywhere in the world. Context matters, content matters, and more than anything, social interaction is what drives education. Um, so, to close, I want to remind you of the quote that I gave you from the beginning from uh, Thomas Edison, uh, that motion pictures would make books obsolete and completely transform the school system within a decade, which he said in 1913. With that in mind, I want to give you another quote. It says, technology will enable us to so modify the learning environment outside of classrooms that much, if not all, knowledge presently try, schools presently try to teach with such pain and expense and such limited success will be learned as a child learns to talk painlessly, successfully, and without organized instruction. So again, this one could, could apply to any number of technologies, but this one is in fact about um, a precursor to one laptop per child spoken by the OLPC co-founder, Seymour Papert. Um, for new mass media and then digital technologies throughout the last hundred years, proponents have often argued that this time really it's different. So I think to open our discussion, I'd like to ask, is it? Thank you very much. Thank you, that's great. Yay. Thank you. Ah. There's so much to talk about here. I think let's pick up on this and then come back to the curated apps because there's a very obvious connection here in terms of uh, maybe how these two things could go together. Um, let me ask a sort of obvious question, um, and I'm, I'm thinking, I think it was yesterday in the Times, there was an article by, uh, there's a study that's come out with, by Common Sense Media about the gap um, between students who have to go home, I think this is primarily high school students, but maybe middle school students as well, who are going home, expected to do homework mm -hmm. on a laptop, or to do, uh, re submit their homework through digital means, or, or very often I think do research. Uh, and you've got kids in this country who don't have that, so they're seriously at a disadvantage. So there's obviously still a need to even the playing field. If you could do one lap talk per child your way, based on what you've learned, what would you do differently? Oh my goodness. Uh, we start with the easy questions, I see. <laughs> um, so I think there are a few things. Um, one thing that I found very interesting about One Laptop Per Child is that they, in order to get attention, they had to really promise big. So they promised mm. radical transformation across the world. And this is something you see with many education and technology projects. Yeah. Unfortunately, I feel like this sets them up for failure in a lot of ways, because you, yeah. you can never deliver utopia. Um, so at the same time, this is how they get attention. So I'm, I'm sort of torn about my answer to this, but my sense is that if one were a lot more realistic about the scope of reform that's possible, about the kinds of effects that technology will have, about the very uh, significant and sustained social and infrastructural costs mm -hmm. um, that really have to go into these projects, they'd be a lot more successful. Um, so often, you know, in, in Paraguay, for example, I went in 2010, the project was flush with money, they had a wonderful support structure. I went back in 2013, they hadn't been able to renew their grants. Nobody wanted mm -hmm. to, you know, nobody wants to fund a project for the long term. They want to right. put a bunch of money in, and they pull out, and everything had been dismantled. It was heartbreaking to see. Um, so if anything, I would say, you know, the technology is almost beside the point. There are a lot of things that will have really great effects, but mm -hmm. what really matters is the, the social and institutional support and the technological support structures to make sure this will last for a long time. So I yeah. think that would be my big, uh, my big change. Well, hopefully we can return to some more positive stories, okay. um, but your story is a very positive story. And so how, mm -hmm. how did you curate the apps and how do you know that they're working? 
So I want to actually take your question and continue Morgan's because I think idea. it's so yeah. important. So a little piece of history would be very interesting. Now Morgan knows this, but very few other people know this. Um, the reason why I became part of this project is because I've been a known critic mm -hmm. of technology um, and I always feel like I'm trying to be the scales of justice, really looking at all the, the, the pros and cons with children's developing reading brain. Nicholas Negroponte actually came to me after the, both the, the mix, we'll call it the mixed success of OLPC. And we had a year and a half dialogue. It was a dialectic. We were going complete from very different viewpoints. And it was at the end of that, and he was only part of this project in the beginning, but it was very necessary to have the kind of almost conflictual nature of our viewpoints coming together to, to really address what Morgan was saying. How do we take not just content, and that's, I think, one of the failures. It was, um, it was the sense that Nicholas had was that all you have to do is just and he would say things like, throw it out of the helicopter, and children would learn. This is absolutely wrong. We want to put the very best knowledge together about how learning occurs, and to use that as the basis of choice. And the children will still have a great amount of choice, but the, the, what they choose from is based on carefully curated content. Now, in the beginning, the apps were really, I would say, very mediocre. But gradually, we're getting to the point where we're actually working with developers, and we have what's called an app map, mm -hmm. developed based on the reading brain, and then we will go to numeracy. But using that as the basis of what every child and every child in different languages needs to have to acquire language. So the first difference is to really take seriously science about content. Second is absolutely what Morgan said. You have to have a social environment. We go nowhere where there aren't parents and communities who really want this for their young. And the third component is evaluation. We're using an open source platform. Everything is evaluated. Engagement is evaluated for every app. Behavioral change is evaluated. So we have an ongoing sense of what not only works in terms of kids' engagement, but what is or is not changing behaviors. So we are looking at a different context of educational settings, and we're looking at what works in rural Alabama and what works mm -hmm. in Ethiopia, and perhaps not unsurprisingly, they are similar. They're similar. They are similar. One of the greatest insights that I have was probably the most ridiculous one. And that was my first introduction to the kids in this tiny little wanchi in Ethiopia. They've never seen an, a, a lamp. They were absolutely like the kids in Lexington, Massachusetts, hmm. with, with all of the, you know, the bell-shaped curve of personality and intelligence. And that made me so, in, in some ways, um, a, a, a humbled yeah. by child development everywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a wonderful thing to find out. So, Marion, if you were a parent and you said, okay, I, I, there's a bunch of apps that, that my kid could use, how would you know which ones are the ones that really develop the, learning, the reading brain? Well, what we are doing now is systematically analyzing exactly what that app is promoting or addressing, regardless of what the app developer says they're doing. And so what we have is almost like ultimately will be a qualitative and quantitative checklist of all these apps, which we'll make available to everyone. That's a piece of what we're doing. Yeah. Are there any characteristics, though? Oh, yes. The characteristics are very simple. They are what are the most important components of that reading brain circuit. Let's just take two. One is letter knowledge. And mm -hmm. you, you, would, you would think that is such a simple thing. It's one of the single best predictors of how those children are going to go on to acquire literacy is their, their, their fluid knowledge of letters and their ability to take whatever the phonemes or sounds of their language, in our case, this is English, and make a correspondence between them. That's what, so every stage there's a whole development mm -hmm. 
of absent, and we're writing about this. In fact, my year at CASBIS last year was about writing what it means, a book for Oxford Press on what it means to be literate in the 21st century and how we can take just that question, mm -hmm. not just for children in Africa and India, which, are, which began it, but for our children in L.A., our children in East Palo Alto. You know, what, what is best for parents is very universal. Um, that's great to know as a parent. So my question then uh, to you, Morgan, would be, um, if we get this right, and there are great apps that help kids, you know, really develop the learning brain, is that because they're learning this in some, you know, on a laptop or a tablet, are we already then towards a technical literacy for these kids, or is mm -hmm. it completely? Yeah. Um, so. Just I have one thing yeah. to follow up, and then I'll, I'll get to that. There was a study that very recently came out about mathematical literacy. Um, there's an app that uh, it, it, it was a part of an experiment, so it's not publicly available yet, but that um, encouraged parents to, to tell bedtime stories that yes. involved mathematics mm -hmm. in a way of kind of breaking down some of the fear around mathematics. Because parents, too, will talk about mathematical concepts with their kids and the way they often talk is, is, is a way that's really imbued with, mm -hmm. with fear, with, oh, I don't get mm -hmm. that. With, mm -hmm. And the kids right. pick up on that. I mean, yeah. the kids pick up on all that stuff. Um, so just the very simple act of using this, I think, once a week mm -hmm. made a huge difference mm -hmm. at the end of, a, you know, a significant difference at the end of the year um, in how kids were doing in mathematics. So anyway, that's, that was, that's a little yeah. follow-up. Um, as far as uh, technological literacy or... or what in my work I often call technological fluency, because okay. literacy is a very kind of surface level. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know how to operate it, you know how to navigate on a mm -hmm. kind of basic level. Um, and what uh, certainly computer science circles often talk about is trying to devote, trying to promote uh, technological fluency where kids are familiar with some of the basics of programming. They okay. feel really confident about, about the machine and about harnessing yeah. the power of the machine. Um, and Programs as they are, most laptop programs do promote technological literacy. Kids are familiar with it. They don't, by default, promote technological fluency. That needs to be an additional piece of work that needs to be done, and, and it's, it's significant. It's difficult. Um, there are a number of new programs out there that are trying to do that. So Code.org has all these <laughs> online modules, Hour yeah. of Code, um, Code Academy, um, there are a lot of, of uh, sort of structured online systems that that encourage kids to at least learn the basics. It's it's you know it's not going to get them to the or you know it might eventually get them to the point where they can open up a shell script and type away. But uh, but in most cases, it's it's just thinking step by step in a very kind of programmatic way, really mm -hmm. breaking things down. Um, which, to be honest, is great for critical thinking more Absolutely. generally. So I think that mm -hmm. that these these projects have a lot of promise. Um, I have watched a lot of kids use these now um, around the Bay Area in particular, and um, they can be very difficult to use still unless they have um, a person there who can help them when they, they mean run they... in. Sorry, the kids, the, the, Which the, the programs, laptops? these programs the can programs? be very difficult okay. to use for yeah. kids mm -hmm. if there isn't an adult there yeah. for the kids to fall back on because the mm -hmm. kids will always get stuck. And, um, and having... Having some kind of social scaffolding in the loop is so crucial, and that's one thing that technology, yeah. it's very hard for technology mm -hmm. to provide. Um, it's, I, I, when I was thinking of your comment mm -hmm. about um, uh, the idea that we would just literally throw them out of the helicopters, <laughs> you know, it, it makes me think about kind of back in the 70s and 80s when, you know, people, I, you know, I, I think about... Um, you know, kids that I knew who really were just sort of mm -hmm. using them very much alone, and they have that sense of discovering it very in a very individual sense. And I know there, there's, there was also sort of community around that where they were learning together. Um, but you had kids of our generation whose parents had no idea what was going on, so they didn't have that scaffolded. And I think that's an assumption that they must come to the table with that's not relevant today. Yeah. So I want to pick up, like, as mm -hmm. always uh, in our conversation here, um, I want to say two things about digital literacy and fluency. One of the things that we found, um, and this was in all areas in Africa where the children had had no exposure at all, was how quickly they acquired it. Within hmm. the first village, a little boy, he had seen nothing. 
He took it, and this was one of those older Motorola Zooms that some of you might remember. It was not simple to turn on. Within four minutes, he turned it on and said, I got mine on. I'm the lion. He then became the teacher of all these other children, and literally within one week, all of the kids in that village knew how to use their laptop. Within one month, every app, every activity had been turned on, and within five months, this little boy, who was really, he'd be a prodigy anywhere, he knew how to hack. Wow. Now, I could never, <laughs> I could never hack that Zoom, but he did. So on the one hand, this early access to digital literacy, I think, is, is pretty simple. But then the role of the, the human, I think, becomes so important. And so one of my takeaways, actually, from co just comparing what's going on in South Africa versus Ethiopia, is not dissimilar from what Sugata Mitra calls the granny effect where there's a human who may or may not even be literate, but who's helping the kids as mm -hmm. a support. And it provides this scaffolding. So I'm really thinking that so much of our knowledge is going to be looking at that incredible importance of the interaction between human and technology, that that may be really ultimately what the future is going to lead us to. Now, I'm going to end with, because I don't talk too much, but I want to end with another comment that you made. It's the critical thinking, what we call deep reading, that's the goal, not decoding. Mm -hmm. I think we can get our children to decode, but can we actually make them move into these very critical skills that move from background knowledge and perspective taking, which is essential for our next generation, all the way down to insight. Peter, I was talking to you about insight and integration. It's the acme. It's the end, the ultimate end of reading. So can we find ways of developing that, both through our human interaction and scaffolding and through, and through the development of ever better apps? So it's, it's not a binary. I mean, that's really what I, I hope that comes out of this. It is not a binary either. Or there's no panacea. Or, you know, I, I've actually moved tremendously towards the middle on this question when I was very negative. But it's not a panacea, but we have to use it with wisdom. So I think it's wisdom that's going to, to help us make the next step. So we shouldn't think about this in terms of tension between but what I grew up with is a notion of literacy and, and a broader sense of literacy. It's really all tied together around a notion of critical thinking. I think so, I, yeah. I think we would totally agree. And that may well be the ultimate definition of the new literacies, the true integration of those critical skills in what area, whatever area of literacy we're talking about. So I think it's time for questions. While we queue one up, I'm going to ask you one really quickly. But... Um, uh, um, I don't know if you, yes, there, there are mics questions. roving, so why don't we get one over here. And while you're getting there, there's one up front. Um, let me ask a, a controversial question. Um, these very high-quality apps that do get the outcomes we're looking for, could they be sponsored by Nestle on the <laughs> one laptop per child? Or is, you know, could you see those business models and those outcomes coming together? Um, it all depends on the content. I can mm -hmm. totally imagine them giving very open-ended money that mm -hmm. um, is not tied to promoting particular products. It's not something I've seen yet, but... Um, what needs to happen to, to get the outcomes with the sponsored money, or if that were a, way, if that were a path? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think just being the people who are actually developing, developing the software to have a very um, you know, complex and well-informed view of what literacy means and what critical mm -hmm. media literacies might look like, and to... You know, if, if depending on where the money comes from, potentially push back and say, no, we're not going to do product placement here. No, we're not. You know, that's yeah. not the point of this. Um, and I, I think it's possible, but but it would really take a firm hand to be able to do that. Yeah, that's great. So I think our first question is, I'm sorry, who's got the mic? There's. Oh, I'm sorry. The mic is right over here. There we go. And then we'll go here next. Thank you. Or the non-live. Oh, oh, that's it's live. the live one. It's Go live. ahead. So it's a question uh, kind of in between the two papers. I'm, um, I'm intrigued about the, 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 the plasticity of the brain relative to reading, and I'm wondering about dyslexia mm -hmm. 
in relation, what a dis, whether it sort of would work the same way if you were dyslexic with a, a hopeless historical mess of an orthography like English, yes. or <laughs> whether you were dealing with Spanish, or whether you're dealing with with Kana, or so oh, that that's one thing. But and the and the question between the two is, I'm intrigued to know whether developments in digital technology are providing tools, instruments, mm -hmm. for pedagogical intervention with dyslexic kids. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably don't know this, but that's my area, <laughs> is dyslexia research. I actually came... Oh, you do know that? <laughs> good, good. Well, it was through trying very hard to understand not only the reading circuit for typical readers, but for dyslexics in different languages, because there really are differences between Chinese and Italian and German and, and English, um, and then there are commonalities. It was through developing interventions for dyslexia, for saying, if this goes wrong, what does that child need, that we developed um, an intervention which is print, but which we are hoping to actually make hybrid, not fully technological, but hybrid, in part because so many children with dyslexia are absolutely gifted in technology, and so we want to use their strengths. And I just want to say one thing, because we're in Silicon Valley. Dyslexia is not about... It, you, it, this is going to be difficult to hear. It's not about reading. It's about a d brain organization that advantages uh, children and adults with extraordinary, usually extraordinary skills spatially. We have our architects. We have 30 to 35 percent of entrepreneurs today uh, have a history of dyslexia. This is an extraordinary brain. When 6,000 years ago we became readers, it became disadvantaged because it was by and large, it's using a different hemisphere for a left hemisphere um, uh, system. So it was disadvantaged, but it's an extraordinary brain, and everything we can possibly do to understand neural diversity, especially in, in this area, you know, what, what better person for technology than a dyslexic brain? I mean, it's an extraordinary gift that's been so mistreated in the educational system. So I just want to say that. <laughs> can't help myself. Yes. What I, what I take away from that. that is that this is um, the new kinds of literacies are actually more accommodating or more advantageous to, to dyslexics. Um, absolutely. Well, first, yes, that's true. But it, I would even go historically and say that by trying to understand dyslexia and what was best for intervention and different kinds of struggles enabled us to make better understanding for all readers. So we went from the particular to the universal, and that has been very helpful. That's great. Is there anything to add on that one? Or? I'm good. Okay, great. I think we're up front here. Hi. Thanks, you guys. I'm asking this question as a, as a parent and as a college teacher and as a reader and a writer. And to drill back to something that was mentioned at the beginning, which is we've talked about literacy, fluency, but fractured attention spans mm -hmm. and how and just what sort of your comments and thoughts on how technologies that have fractured our attention span so vastly, mm -hmm. um, particularly in you know, absorbing new knowledge and critical knowledge, mm -hmm. what, how, you know, how can technology be the path to solve that problem or is that, you know, what are the things that need to be kept in mind and how, what's the ba balance between analog and digital in that? So I've been involved in some of the uh, multitasking research that has gone, gone on here at Stanford um, when I was a graduate student here. And, um, and between that and several classes in communication that ban laptops in the lectures, which is generally not very popular with the students, but we in fact assign at the beginning of the class several papers that show that, ch that, that students, college students who use laptops in classes consistently get lower grades because they are multitasking. The, the temptation is just so strong when you have the laptop right there to just flip up your email, to flip up your Facebook. Um, and I think one thing to really push back against it, whether it's technological or not, is, is a sense of mindfulness. And there's a growing movement. Um, there are some classes up at University of Washington by a colleague of mine that, that promotes mindfulness and technology. And in fact, they start every class period with a meditation um, about not just technology use, but about the day. I mean, being mindful in one's life generally is a very useful thing, especially as more and more of our lives are precarious, more and more of our, our um, economic realities become fractured. Um, you know, work, 
I think maybe, maybe for many of us in this room, work is a little more stable, but for a large portion of the population, um, their realities sort of fracture their lives. You know, their partial attention is, is needed because they're jumping around to lots of different things. Um, and, uh, and I think there are various technological apps that can promote mindfulness in various ways, but you don't need technology for that either. You can, you can really work on it on your own. Um, I would say that would be a, a sort of central, to the research I've seen at least, that would be a very central thing. I'd like to add only a little bit to you, Margaret. <laughs> Margaret and I have had these, some of these conversations before, but um, the book that I really hope to finish in the next year is actually a, a Rilke-inspired book. It's called Letters to the Good Reader, The Contemplative Dimension in the Future Reading Brain. And it's really trying to develop a trajectory for, for thinking about human development in which we begin um, I believe, um, not, not unlike Aristotle, with the idea that reading is about knowledge and it's about entertainment, but it's also about the contemplative, reflective aspect of our intelligence. And how can we instill that? And I love what Morgan is saying. I'm actually doing some, uh, trying to review the work on mindfulness um, in the schools to see whether or not that's a, a particular help. Uh, Catherine Isbister, who was a fellow last year, is a person who's working on game design. And we're trying to figure out whether or not, um, again, two sides, that we can uh, develop apps or games that help instill the contemplative, that actually will force changes or invite changes in attention. But I would only end with the, the comment um, to Margaret and to all of us. Um, it's not just about our children. It's about um, all of us. And I, I've done one interview after another for NPR because people are saying they are losing their own immersion into the reading life and their own distractibility, their own lack of quality of attention is beginning to affect them personally. So I think there are various things one can do but one is to ask yourself how you have changed and go back to a book that you have read perhaps in graduate school and loved. I tried Herman Hesse's glass bead game. <laughs> it was a horrible experience. <laughs> this is a book I loved. He got a Nobel Prize for it. And the experience of going back to this very dense prose which had to slow me down totally was an experience that I hope all of you try for yourself. See how you have changed. And it's understanding our own change that I think will also help lead to understanding the need to, from the formative standpoint, be sure that's part of our children's development. So. It's such an interesting <laughs> uh, exercise going back. I've done the same thing recently, though. I chose Marilyn Robinson, who is, of course, a delightful... Yeah. But it, Well, no, I went back to housekeeping because yes. I hadn't read her in so long. But just a quick shout-out before we go to the next question, um, because my daughter is 12 and is doing National Novel Writing Month. Mm. And uh, obviously there's a deep connection between writing and reading, but it's the immersion and the sustained effort um, that is just remarkable to see in a kid. I'm sitting there on my laptop doing 7 million things. She is writing, I think she's so far written 5,000 words. And it's the beginning of the month. And she's completely absorbed in it because she's been given a task and given a time and a goal in words. The, the novel is, so far, completely amazing. It's about parents that are so boring that they disappear. <laughs> um, but there are these, you know, there are the, the, and, and you know, Nan NaNoWriMo is, is mediated by wonderful technology. I mean, she goes on the website every day and logs, actually many times a day, and logs the number of words that she's written obsessively throughout the day. She watches this little, um, uh, you know, chart go up. And, um, yes, yeah, so there's a technology component to it, but it's essentially just the asking and the creating of space for something sustained and immersive and creative. So I shout out for that. If you don't mind, I wanted to connect back to yeah. that to something you said before about the sustained focus that mm -hmm. um, some in our generation had around computers yes. um, when, you know, in the 1980s and just how much computers have changed since then. It's a very different machine. We talk about computers as if it's a sort of this monolithic concept, but, but um, you know, many people today understand computers as media machines yes. fundamentally, and that's yes. something that is, is somewhat new since our generation. 
Um, I think another thing, though, I've, so I've been, it, it was funny for you to mention that because I've been collecting interviews among developers all across mm -hmm. Silicon Valley about um, their founding stories, mm -hmm. how they came to computers and what it meant for them. And first I let them tell the story that they tend to tell um, in circles, like, oh, there I was with the computer. <laughs> it's just me and the computer, and it was great. But then I start digging a little. I say, yeah. oh, what did your parents do? Um, in a lot of cases, there was a father engineer, occasionally a mother engineer. Um, not always. Um, you know, I ask what resources they had around. They usually had Scientific American with the back page mm -hmm. of, of BASIC, and they would type yeah. in. They had a number of programs around. They had a pretty stable family life in a lot of cases, middle class, um, generally. And, um, and they had you know, sometimes non-parental mentors. And I think a lot of those things fade into the background when we kind of mythologize yeah. the, the lone hacker renegade, which is still such a powerful myth. And it was really drove the development of One Laptop a Child. When I interviewed many of the OLPC developers, they'd say, this is what I want to enable. But by, by ignoring all of this social and infrastructural pr privilege that they had growing up, um, it, it just doesn't work the same. And the fact yeah. that computers are very different. So well, I just I think, wanted to kind of tie that in. I think those in. kids felt alone at the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. that's what's driving Absolutely. It. And I, I think that, I that's important. It's an important part of the story, too. It is. It is. And that's sort of what part, partly drew them, too. I think. Okay. So we've got another question back here. Thank you so much. I've really loved the focus on the interaction of the human and the computer here. And um, I wanted to see if you could maybe extend the conversation about the new literacies to something that I think one of you mentioned early on, but we haven't really discussed much, which is the idea of digital citizenship. And this idea that um, it's not that just a literacy of, you know, learn to read and the math, but it's also a social emotional learning um, that goes on. So I wanted to see if you have any insights mm. into that. So I will, I will just say that part of our work in trying to understand deep reading and being able to imbue it is to have a kind of taxonomy, if you will, of critical skills. And one of the very important ones is perspective taking. And we're actually, um, I'm going to turn to you, Jack, we're actually using the theology of John Donne, his concept of passing over, which you, some of you very few of you would, uh, would know, but it's really about how do we take on the perspective of other and really mm -hmm. embed our apps. So we're trying to develop early literacy apps that inspire passing over to all of these different others to the children wherever they are. So we develop templates or we are developing templates so that one of the major goals um, is really an ethical um, approach to daily life that involves the perspective of another who might be living next door in a neighborhood, in another country, another religion, mm -hmm. another time. So it's transporting them from wherever they are to this other. So perspective taping is a really important aspect that we hope to implant in our li early literacy uh, stories and tales. And it's certainly much needed. I feel like um, I've been really dismayed at the amount of um, hatred that comes out online. That you know, if, if you have a divergent opinion, um, you can be really targeted in, a, in an incredibly a scary way. Um, and I, you know, the roots of this I think are are very complex. There's of course the anonymity online, but um, but that's no. That is, that is simply a means. That is not the reason this is happening. Um, one might point to various parenting trends that, that didn't really emphasize emotional development as much in, in a generation that's sort of coming of age now. Um, but whatever the cause is, I think there are some solutions. Um, they're difficult. I think Marianne points to some. Um, certainly, you know, even uh, pediatricians in the area have started handing out just a handout on emotional intelligence and how to develop that in very young children. And I think that, that shows some promise. And that, you know, that's going to potentially everyone. Um, whether they follow it or not is another, is another matter. Um, I think the solution will have to be uh, multifaceted. Technology can play a role. Parents obviously play an important role in this. Peers do. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think we've got one right over here. Just wait for the mic one second. There we go. Um, as you know, indigenous, indigenous languages around the world are disappearing at an accelerated rate, just like indigenous species. Uh, 
Is there a concern or do you have policies about how to protect indigenous languages? In other words, kids growing up in Mexico speaking only Nahuatl uh, and their parents write poetry in Nahuatl. Mm -hmm. Do they have to learn on a, a Spanish app mm -hmm. or a, a, how can we protect indigenous languages and the richness that they bring to our global culture? That's a great question. So I will tackle it, but I will not tell you that we have an answer. We have an approach. In the beginning, we were in villages where only Oromo, not Amharic, were, were, these were uh, smaller minority languages, if you will. Um, and the parents wanted to have their children learn English for economic reasons. At that time, that was 2011-12, we, there were no Oromo apps, of course. But what we're trying to do, and that's where the approach comes, we're developing a linguistic template, if you will. A lot of us are, are forms of linguistics are infused in this. And so the template is then to be given, not unlike your question, what are the skills we want? Here, here they are in English and how we are addressing them. And now we are helping people in Oromo translate those into Oromo apps. And there's, um, there's going to be a new um, X Prize for global literacy in which, again, that approach will be taken so that the children will be learning whatever the indigenous language is and then English will be also available. So again, we're looking at a world that's connected. So. Well, and certainly the socio-political implications of this are, are long-standing. I mean, there's been a long history of colonization and forced language assimilation. Um, and there were a lot of early fears around one laptop per child that, um, that it would force people to learn English. It was translated to Spanish, but you know, in, in uh, Paraguay, for example, there are two official languages, Spanish and Guarani, and in the, in, in the rural areas in particular, Guarani is, is spoken almost exclusively. Spanish, you know, they kind of shoehorn it into the schools, and in fact, uh, some kids don't pass third grade because they have a Spanish proficiency test at the end of third grade, and if they haven't practiced enough, they're not going to pass it. Um, and uh, that said, I did find um, some, some rays of hope. So the OLPC program in Peru didn't have a lot of support. It was, a, as far as I can tell, a, a bit of a government PR stunt. They handed out laptops, shook hands, took pictures of smiling children, got reelected, and there was almost no follow-up. There was no training, very little infrastructure. Um, but there was a local group of activists in Puno that translated the OLPC interface into Amira and to Quechua, both. Um, and Peru does have a long history of, of activism and resistance to kind of colonial impulses, whether they come from Lima or from abroad. Um, so I think Peru in particular is well set up for that. And it's, it's unclear at this point whether those translations are having much of a, you know, if they're being spread, if they're having much of an effect. But the fact that they happened, I think, is, is significant. And there's more and more uh, content. There's a Wikipedia, Guarani Wikipedia page now that there never was before. Um, there's more content in Guarani. Um, there's still very little compared to how much there is in Spanish. So I think that it's an ongoing question and something that certainly anthropologists have, have been thinking um, very carefully about because the questions of soft colonialism are really, um, are really deep in these sorts of problems. That's a great question. Um, I think it's a wonderful question to end on. I'd like to uh, thank both Marianne and Morgan for this and for all of your wonderful questions. And yes, it looks you. like we now get to have lunch together. So thank you guys so much. Thanks.